halfway stage in a season which is defined by those who maybe want to just take their foot off the pedal just a little bit. A series in which your main criteria for getting in is really how much of an elder statesman you are. You make the push, you make the challenge, you pay your time, you pay your dues, and you make your way to the 60 plus racing adventures. Pro Masters here at Watkins Glen, the boot layout, in just a couple of moments' time on iRacing Live and Racebot TV. So, you want to race in NASCAR? The road starts here. Introducing the eNASCAR at Night series powered by iRacing. This is the gateway for all aspiring 13 to 16 year olds. Starting June 20th, ignite your dreams of one day racing in the top tiers of NASCAR. Go to www.iracing.com slash ignite for full details. We are in Cam Walsh country at the moment, upstate New York. We're here in Watkins Glen for the sixth round of the 60 plus racing adventures. Two races on the night, both of a sprint race feature length of 16 laps worth of action. Qualifying just coming to an end here on iRacing Live and Racebot TV. I am Mr. Hashtag, do you mind? Jake Sperry, the observer of Sim Racing, joined with Neil Heaty in the commentary booth with me. Qualifying just about to come to an end. 27 drivers looking to set a time, and this is how the first grid will set up. Ronald Fitterer then on the pole, 143.282. He'll be joined by Jos van der Ven and Manning Grinnan, second and third. John Morgan will start this one from fourth position. Franz Brink and Jay Friels will start from fifth and sixth with Joel Martin and Romigo de Pasqua finishing in seventh and eighth in qualifying. Andrew Fitterer, a race winner in this series, starts ninth with Kenneth Baldwin in tenth. John Unsby and Richard Valley make it on to row six. Row seven sees Gerard Florison and Bob Coe uh, with Gianni Raspaldo and Bruce Poole on 15th and 16th positions. Kenneth Dummer and Richard Coulomb make up row nine with row 10 seeing Paul Hamilton and David Riley. Paolo Bonacera will start 21st with Charles Gilly in 22nd. Ralph Kemmerer, William Stark, Jeff Cantor, Wallen Maltzby and Larry Thomas round out the 27 drivers taking it to this opening race. And well, Neil, it's a very, very difficult circuit. One where drafting opportunities are going to be massive in these pro Mazdas. Everyone's going to be falling into these corners. We'll be on a rolling start for this one as well. So hopefully we won't see any pro Mazda instance like the one in Toronto just a week ago. Indeed, rolling starts here, and as you did point out, lots of very good drafting opportunities from turn one all the way up to the bus stop chicane. The inner loop is flat out, so expect to see some Daytona style uh, drafting here. But the real part of this track that sets uh, the cars apart is the boot. It is so, so difficult. So many off camber corners, so many corners that just go on forever and are so tempting to put the throttle on just that little bit early. And with how tight it is through there, not much grass before you uh, meet the armco, a single mistake there could end your race. It certainly could here, Neil. And you look at this track conditions that we have out here today. Quite pleasant, it has to be said. Mostly cloudy. It's 26 degrees in the air, 32 degrees on the track. Wind speed, two kilometers an hour, heading in from the north with a rising humidity of 55%. Just like any normal Pro Master race you would get on the iRacing service, 17 instants are available, but there is one big difference here in this series. There is no limit to the amount of fast repairs you may have, so you can bin the vehicle four times and still get another vehicle to get out and going again but of course the boot layout some may argue that classic boot layout will be a little bit better for overtaking neil but that chicane oh it's so so tricky to get right that train vet that chicane i should say rather very difficult to get right especially when you're going to be in a pack like most of these cars will be on the first lap and of course there's a quick right left right flick but of course there's really no respect uh 
relaxing in that final uh, right flick because you're straight onto that carousel which is deceptively fast most of the time diving banked downhill right hander an incredible credible corner to get right if you do but as but there is a little bit more strategy in this race as the races require pit stops both of them so we've got to see what uh, these drivers do in terms of strategy when they take that pit stop will they take it early to try and get in the clean air or will they try and take it as late as possible well, we will see, of course, the key thing about drafting circuits is you've got to get yourself a drafting partner as they head to the toe of the boot. A different line on the outside, some may argue, you can use that as part of the racing line as that has been changed over the years and adapted and moulded so that it works the way they have. Of course, in sim racing terms itself, Watkins Glen, the proverbial stomping ground of the five-time iRacing World Champion, Team Redline's Finnish Dynamo, Gregor Hutu, and the victory he got earlier this year when he made it an overtake at this next corner, the heel of the boot, with just four corners to go. Up the hill will be the next corner, though, an off-camber left-hander, which is always going to be tricky to stay too wide at. And these drivers understand this and they know what is capable of it. It's also worth noting that if 16 laps do not get completed, and we expect that they do, 45 minutes get put on the clock as well as they cycle to the penultimate corner behind the iRacing roof first safety car to peel off down onto pit road at the end of the sweeping turn number 12. 5.42 kilometers then pace behind Donald Fitterer in the 111 machine pace car dives down onto the lane and he's going to go early green flag flies and we are underway at Watkins Glen run to the 90 turn number one Fitterer is already clear they're too wide John Morgan Manning Grinnan as they look to hit themselves on the brakes Franz Brink looking down to the inside as they fan through this opening section it seems everyone for the moment is clean as they all charge up through the S's for the very first time making that run two car breakaway already as Jos van der Ven who is always up near the front now looks to attack the race lead take it away from Fitterer who immediately goes on the defensive into this next section and it's a check up slightly from van der Ven who decides he does not have the power to make the move into the chicane Neil Yes, not close enough to make a move in that chicane, but a very, very clean start from all 27 of these drivers as they dive down the carousel. No, it's Paul Hamilton going around there at the S. He got a check-up from Kern, and someone else has gone off two. They've actually gone off one. Is Bruce Paul, who would not be happy about that. In fact, the third there, that's Kemmerer spinning it around. Someone else who didn't quite get time to get an eye on has also gone around that S section, that carousel. Sorry, not the carousel, just before it. Uh, yeah, the uh, chicane always going to be very, very difficult to go and get right. Larry Thomas was the other name that ended up involved in the early stages. Four drivers then getting involved quickly as the leaders now head to the heel of the boot. Victor, Van der Ven, Grinnen, Morgan, Brinks, Friels, De Pasqua in seventh, Kenneth Baldwin, eighth, Fiddler, ninth, Unsby in tenth. Keep an eye on this one from Andrew Fiddler. He surprises drivers as he now looks to attack Kenneth Baldwin here through this off camber turn number 10. Looking for turn 11 now here, Neil. And you have to feel that patience is going to be a massive factor in today's style of racing as using all of the curb there was Baldwin. Yep, patience is most certainly a virtue and you may well need it today. You may not necessarily lead the, uh, lead the pack to the line at the end of this race if you're leading with one to go, such as the drafting nature of Watkins Glen as you see them all go a little bit wide at uh, turn one there. But coming up the hill, Donald Fitzgerald seems to have a nice little lead over the season one winner, Jos van de Ven. But as you were saying in that instant at the uh, bus stop, uh, she came, Bruce Poe was involved that but certainly not going to help his championship chances in the Super 70s class. He was in second place before this race. Yeah, he certainly was. Side by side, Fiddler goes from offense to defense as John Unsby tries to find a way around the outside. That doesn't work and he bails out of it there. Fiddler, understanding his parameters of his vehicle quite nicely then 
as he heads himself now to the chute, which has always been a famous corner in sim racing, thanks to Alexius Yakla and a major incident about three years ago. But still right now, Manny Grinnan on the attack towards the heel of the boot. Jos van der Ven suddenly coming up into a defensive stance. And that middle part of the lap, if you start getting worried by the dirty air effect that does exist here in these Pro Masters, not as strong as you'd see, say, in a Formula 1 vehicle, maybe even not as strong as you'd see in a Formula Renault 2.0, you see here, Neil, how Manning Grinnan suddenly just loses a little bit of time and Van der Ven finds a lot coming through the heel of the boot to halve down the gap to Donald Fitterer. Yep, Van der Ven, uh, the Dutch driver, finding a lot through the boot there, as you were saying. But yes, the dirty air effect can have a massive detriment to your lap time. The understeer just comes in and sometimes you can just see the wall coming and do nothing about it to stop it. But it seems the leader of the race at the moment, Donald Fitterer, has pulled away ever so slightly. It seems the two behind him have been battling through the boot. And indeed, the two behind him, Van der Ven and Grinnen, have a nice second gap or so over fourth place. John Morgan. Yes, they do, but six tenths of a second is very much still within the drafting range for Jos van der Ven. There may even be the chance of underfueling some of these vehicles because you can save a lot in the draft. But here's John Unsby here. He's seen Fiddler in front of him. Kenneth Baldwin now under pressure here to the outside. Tries Mr. Fiddler. And what can he do? Not enough on the outside. Has to check it up, but he's going to try and hold on to the rear as if it's just a toy that he does not want to let go of. And suddenly Unsby goes on the offensive through the right-hander of that carousel. So easy to wash out, hang yourself out to dry. No opportunities yet to go and make that move. Keep an eye on this one for fourth position as well here, Neil, because John Morgan is being harassed here by Franz Brink. And Brink knows that he's on the brink of fourth place. Something else very interesting about the 60 Plus Racing Adventure series we have here is that all of these cars are fixed setup. They all have the same setup, so uh, you can't uh, do it to say uh, be better in the boot or be better in the straights. You all have the same tools to work with. So it really is a little bit of um, a, well, it's almost totally reliant on driver skill here as well. And that's how we've seen Stefan Roskin, not here today this weekend, but how he's managed to get a perfect score so far. 175 from 175. His closest uh, rival is Bill Lawrence, who I'm uh, just seeing if I can find him in the pack, and I can actually, so I don't think he's here this weekend either. No, he isn't, so opportunities for points to be allotted as now lap traffic starts to play a factor into the into the 90, sorry, in there. Larry Thomas forcing Manning Grinnan to go incredibly wide over the grass. That's going to pick up an incident point as Wally Molesby gets around it as well. That has really checked up this field and created a little bit of a punch hole in the gaps. That's allowing John Morgan ever so slightly close this one back down in. Lap traffic can always play a factor and it did there in that situation. It's given Fitra just that little bit of breathing room and now there is traffic in between. I believe that is uh, Morgan and Brink now oh, trying to get past Molesby as there's an incident. Yep, contact behind is Jay Friels and Remigio, uh, Remigio de Pasqua, who was in about seventh place before that incident. It looks like uh, he has uh, came together with the car that was in sixth place, but they are coming all the way down the order again. But having a look at all that traffic along the back straight towards the uh, inner loop there, it almost looked like a 150 mile an hour traffic jam. Well, it did look like a big traffic jam as John Unsby goes for a slide coming out of the toe of the boot. That was contact with Andrew Fiddler. Two into one, didn't go on the exit. And all of a sudden, there were a lot of worries. So now it's just starting to pick up here in this 60 plus Racing Adventures League. They're all starting to get a little bit aggressive as now John Martin is going to be the next vehicle to be put a lap down by your race leader, Donald Fitter, as we look to head to lap five out of 16, out on circuit. The pit stop window happening very, very soon, as now this is going to change quite a little bit then in terms of this field. So Fitter still leads. Van der Ven currently going around the outside in second position. Manning Grinnan in third. Now it's Morgan and Brink fifth, but now it's six, seven, eight. Uh, you're looking at Baldwin, look at Fiddler, and Gerard Florison now is into eighth position and is up and over. Contact with Larry Thomas, the lap traffic. That one down at the 90. And Larry Thomas, who really didn't know where to go through that corner, it seemed it was pick a lane from Gerard Florison, who had nowhere to go on the apex. Nowhere to go on the apex. And again, that is one of the. Um 
One of the mysteries of Watkins Glen is where to turn into that turn one and indeed it is very difficult, very very difficult when you have lapped traffic like that, not exactly knowing where to go. Uh, yes, it's just, it's just sometimes one of these things, but could it be avoided? Very well possibly. Very well possibly, we've seen Wally Mosby also hit the wall, that one was coming out of the chicane, the bus stop chicane, but for now at least, Manning Grinnan has been dropped off of the back of the leading pair, Van der Ven and Fitterer. Van der Ven has been sat behind the entirety of this race, hasn't been in a position to make any moves, but I think he'll be certainly all well and dandy at the moment. Bob Kern, though, this one for a top 10 position. Now he's fighting Richard Coulomb for position. And well, at the moment, it seems that Coulomb probably need a little bit more kinetic energy to get a move on. Yep, Coulomb just needing a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, more speed out of that pro master car. But yes, just coming on, I believe well, it's the uh, most difficult corner of this track where the boot rejoins the NASCAR circuit. An incredibly difficult corner is off camber and you need to take it far slower than, you, than it initially appears. The Pasqua's engine has just given up the ghost at the heel of the boot. He is out of the event now. And that's going to hurt, but he will be able to get back out and going, but he's got to take a toe. So effectively, no points on offer. Here's Jos van der Ven, though, looking at that race lead here on lap 6 of 16. Tucked in the toe, moves to the outside to try and make the move on Donald Fitterer and isn't going to get the chance. Wasn't close enough to make that move. Really have to be following out of that section, those S's sections there, Neil, because you have to be within two tenths of a second, really, to try and be able to make that move. At least, yes, coming into a uh, braking for that bus stop chicane. You've got to be incredibly, incredibly brave on the brakes, i.e. not use them, or be side by side when on, on the inside in order to make a pass into the inner loop there. But that's what Jos van der Ven is doing at the moment, is a little bit of psychology. Just sort of like making sure he's being noticed in the mirrors of Donald Fitterer and just trying to, f uh, trying to force Fitterer into a mistake at some point. Donald Fitter at the moment has shown no signs. He's been stoic in his defence. Not seeing anything. There's a lunge down to the inside, though, at the off-camber turn number 10. But running very nicely around the outside was Donald Fitter. Van der Ven did not have much that he could do in that situation to try and get himself through. As still, we've got other battles on circuit. Gianni Rispaldo under pressure. This is Richard Valley looking to try and find a way through in the number 69 machine against the 48 of Rispaldo. And Rispaldo at the moment doing a very good job of things as the 111 machine actually Donald Fitterer decides it's time to come down onto the lane here on the end of lap six, as does Kenneth Baldwin. Yep, uh, coming in on, as you said, at the end of lap six, perhaps deciding that he wants to try and find a little bit of uh, clean air. Perhaps he's managed to see a place on track where there is clean air, but that has allowed Jos van der Ven to take, um, sorry, that's allowed Manning Grinnen to take an uh, essential lead of the race over Jos van der Ven as uh, they come up towards the bus stop now. No passing there from Van de Ven, so perhaps uh, the Dutchman will decide to come in next time by uh, to try and uh, stop losing time behind Grinnen. Yeah, and all that came down to that final corner because Van de Ven, I thought, got caught out there by an early pit stop from Donald Fitterer. He went down for that inside, had to back out of it, and that always allowed Manning Grinnen to get himself up to the point. So Manning Grinnen knew and understood that he could get himself to exactly where he needed to be. But right now in the middle of a pit stop cycle, it's about getting the most consistent lap times and quick lap times out. In terms of where coming out has gone at a certain Donald Fitterer, he's in a lot of clean air. Paul Hamilton, many, many seconds down the road as we will get a track map up with the difference between the 47 and the 111 Fitterer. Right now, heading through the toe of the boot. Manning Grinnan, for example, is in the penultimate corner right now. And the question will become, will anyone decide to cover off the move of Donald Fitterer coming down onto lane? The answer's gonna be no. I reckon they're going to try and run their fuel tanks dry and get a quicker stop on the lane. Yep, trying to, uh, trying to go to the very end of what the fuel tanks allow is another very good strategy. Perhaps uh, perhaps the 111 car of Donald Fitter decided to um, start off lights, then take a full tank at the pit stop. Van de Ven, uh, Grinnen, 
uh, John Morgan for example he's yet to come in as well deciding to start off with a full tank then uh, pitting just enough for Splash and Dash to make it to the end of the race this is again where this pit strategy comes in and it's going to be very interesting to see who triumphs in terms of this but we probably won't be able to see the results of it for another four or five laps or so and I'll tell you who will be losing out will be the 53 of Franz Brink who missed his box on the lane so that's going to be an issue lead pass though as Jos van der Ven has made his way through got to keep your head on the swivel here because you look at what happened there with Manning Grin and didn't have the pace just pure draft from Jos van der Ven who stayed committed and it's a little bit of a lean out from Manning Grin and didn't want to leave any room for incident on the circuit he prioritizes finishing the race first more rather than getting himself back out and in terms of where Franz Brink came out in comparison he came out behind Kenneth Baldwin by some margin as they're side by side Gianni Raspado and Bob Kern both have come in and made a stop they're both looking at this one and Raspaldo on the outside is going to commit and make the move stick as well good work from the Italian as he now moves himself up into 16th position up into 16th place now for Espaldo. Points are awarded to the top 24. So even if you are a lap down or so, it's always worth keeping on driving to get those uh, valuable, valuable points. But yes, Gianni Respaldo managed to uh, get past there up into 16th place. A nice job to make it uh, work through the bus stop. Certainly has. Jos van der Ven, though, is not safe under pressure through the 90. Little bit of a wiggle, though, as he heads through the corner. He was trying to stay tight through that section. You can run wide out onto the tarmac section that they have, the runoff, but sometimes it doesn't work through turn number three now and up through the gears at turn number four at 225 kilometers an hour. Manning Grinham pulls out early, looking to go to the outside to make the move on lap number nine. And he is going to go around the outside. Van der Ven will let him and will take the race lead back once more. So Jos van der Ven dropping backwards into second position. I also saw Joel Martin run into an incident as now Jared Florison and Andrew Fiddler come down onto the lane. Jay Friels as well has been on the lane for a very, very long time as well. So a lot of drivers then have run themselves into a couple of issues as the pit stop cycle continues. Yes, just a couple of issues, but I think what you saw there for that pass for the, well, I'll say the provisional needs at the moment, because you just do not know where Donald Fisher is going to come back out again. But uh, this pass for the provisional lead with Manning Grinnan, Jos van der Ven, uh, very, very smart head by just allowing Grinnan that place to try and, uh, so he doesn't lose that much time, because if you battle, that could well be your chance of the uh, win gone, because, uh, of course, uh, Donald Fisher will be in clean air at this point. So we've got to see... What these two drivers do is they come through the penultimate corner now. Will either of them come into the pits? Coming around the final corner, a very, very fast corner. Apex speed of about 110 miles an hour. And Jos van der Ven decides to pit, Manning Grinnan not. Now you could see how van der Ven was slowing down through that, that final corner, sorry, to try and make sure that he was on the lane as quickly as possible. He had been losing time. Grinnan's last lap was a 44 flat. The lap before for Donald Fitterer was a 43.9. He had that gap under 30 seconds on the racing circuit. Keep an eye on that 111 as we get a map comparison between the 167 and that 111. Here's Fitterer coming out of the final corners. Van der Ven in the penultimate box, getting the fuel, hoping to get out going. But here comes a certain Mr. Fitterer who will go breezing by into the 90 turn number one. And Van der Ven has lost a lot of time on that stop. And he was getting a little bit too pedestrian, in my opinion, there, Neil, to get himself that opportunity. And it's cost him about three seconds overall. Yes, it's very, very difficult when you're battling someone to try and keep up the same lap times as someone who is in clean air. And that's exactly what happened to Jos van der Ven. Lost all that time because he was battling Manning Grinnan throughout that uh, central portion of race one. And that's allowed, uh, that's allowed um, uh, Donald Fitterer to have that about three, three and a half second lead over him. Now, Manning Grinnan has a lap or two of clean air without having to worry about van der Ven. The question is, when will Grinnan come in and where will he be in relation to the one six? Seven and the treble one. Well, we will see Manning Grinnan at the moment. He's heading himself to the penultimate corner on lap 10 of 16. It's five to go. Uh, the next time they come across the line at the moment, it will be six to go when they cross the line. And Grinnan's going to stay out on this strategy. And we'll see what sort of lap time he does right now. And he does himself on his own a 43.2. That's a very good lap 
from Manning Grin, and he is forcing Donald Fitterer to go maybe a little bit faster as the 177 with John Morgan hits the lane as he looks to try and make his one and only stop, he hopes, for the evening's worth of racing. But Fitterer right now, running himself through the final corner. We've got to see a time comparison. He brought the gap down to 28.3 seconds, which is more than enough in my view. And he crosses the line and does himself a 43.287. He was marginally faster by 11 thousandths of a second that last time by. 11 thousandths of a second really isn't anything though, is it? You can just say it's identical lap times, essentially. But coming up the hill now is Donald Fitter in the, that treble one car, that right-handed turn four still flat out now, trying to spot his uh, braking point for the bus stop chicane. Of course, it is really not that big a braking point. Doing it from about 145 miles an hour or so down to 105. So really, that, uh, that bus stop chicane is just a mere comma to the rest of the track if you will uh, just before they get to the uh, the uh, almost flat out carousel but yes as you said 28.9 seconds the gap between the two of them as they came across the line last time will Manning Grinning come in this time he's just rejoining the short circuit coming up to the penultimate corner well, we will see if he dives down in. We've also got a battle on circuit right now. John Morgan, who has just come out of pit road, he's in a scrap with Kenneth Baldwin here. And this one for position as well. Baldwin, who has really gained Grinnan comes in for the pit stop window. And yes, Manning Grinnan dives down onto the lane. So we will pay all of our attention onto where Grinnan will come out in comparison. It's a slow pit road in terms of length, but at 70 kilometers an hour, there or thereabouts, you've got to be really pushing on that limiter to make sure that you use all of the circuit available he now moves onto the concrete surface which is always very difficult to hit the brakes and he gets so on perfect track map up on the screen as we keep an eye on Donald Fitra who is already breezing his way now down the front stretch and past out and away comes Manning Grin and where's Van der Ven in all of this he's just coming out of the 90 right about now they'll come out side by side and here's an opportunity for Jos Van der Ven pick up the pace get into the draft and he may have half a chance to run here now he may well have a chance to come climbing up, up the hill. And of course, being in a slipstream is very beneficial, especially when you're coming up a hill. Moving to the inside is the Dutchman, the season one champion. Side by side, as they come along to the bus stop chicane. Will Man and Grinnan let off and let him have the place? Well, I say let him have the place. There's no such thing in racing. But Jos van der Ven takes that second place. Now, the question is, with five laps to go, can he chase down... Uh, can you chase down that uh, three and a half seconds or so to Fitterer? It's going to be difficult, but if he does, he needs to be running some sensational lap times to do so. Kenneth Baldwin through as well on John Morgan. A fantastic move as the pit stop cycle has effectively ended. John Unsby has come down onto lane, as has Richard Coulomb as well. So we'll get a reset then at the end of this lap. Understand where everyone is in the field. We've got a fantastic train though at the moment. Gianni Raspado, Bob Kern, Paolo Bonacera, Richard Coulon, Kenneth Dummer, Paul Hamilton, all split by about four seconds on the road here, Neil. And when you've got six vehicles in four seconds, we know that sometimes fireworks like to start going off. It's going to be like having uh, the star out of Mario Kart for the person at the back of this train, isn't it? They're going to have no air resistance whatsoever. But coming down to the heel of the boot, Gianni Rispaldo leading this, uh, this uh, big, big pack. But yes, we've got some lap traffic there, just letting them pass one of the other cars further back. I think it was the fifth in line trying to get all of the slipstream possible. But uh, yes, it does seem at the moment that it's all sort of like okay towards the rear end of this uh, pack however Gianni Rispaldo and Bob Kern may have a little bit of a fight for that 10th place position coming down to the 90. Yes they will Gianni Rispaldo goes defensive all the way to the pit wall and then moves back to the racing line knowing that he is not going to be overtaken. Gap at the front of the field is 2.9 seconds in favour of Jos Van, well in favour of Donald Fitter against Jos Van der Ven but keep an eye on Rispaldo and Kern here. Kern certainly has the draft, the ability to go out and attack this course and will attack this course with everything that he's got. John Morgan makes his way through on Kenneth Baldwin. Andrew Fiddler makes his way through on Frank Brink. Is it going to be three in three moves? No, it's not because Gianni Rispaldo cannot get himself uh, overtaken in that situation. He's done well to hold on. 
Yes, that move between uh, Baldwin and Morgan, very, very similar to what we saw Jos van der Ven do on Grinning coming out of the pits. Got well up and past before even the braking zone for the uh, bus stop chicane. So very nice move there from uh, John Morgan. The question is, can Kenneth Baldwin uh, do anything in reply? But this long, long train you were saying down in ninth place excuse me, uh, coming up towards the hill now over the crest of the hill and down into what is a very, very deceptively steep downhill right-hander. That is the uh, heel of the boot. And it appears yet again that Bob Carey could not find a way past Respaldo. Oh, and Kenneth Dummer, I believe that was, had gone down the inside, but too deep on Richard Coulomb. So he gets an up and under and loses out on the position once more. Gap comes down at the front of the field. Three laps to go, 2.4 seconds. Now the difference. Van der Ven running 42 nines on his own. 43-3 from Fitterer and the 42-7-6-7 from Manning Grinnan, which is just two thousandths of a second off of the fastest lap of the race, which was set on the previous lap by Jos van der Ven. So van der Ven is throwing everything, but he needs eight tenths of a second a lap now. He needs Fitterer to start falling off of a cliff here, and I don't see that happening there. That's a very, very big ask in such a flat out, fast track such as uh, Watkins Glen. And especially when you're running fixed setups as well. As it looks like Bob Cairn in that 10th place car, the number six, maybe move, maybe uh, setting up for a move on Gianni Rispaldo as they come down towards the bus stop chicane. Not close enough that time round, but these two battling and psyching each other out has allowed uh, Paolo Bonacera to get closer and closer to the two of them. Well, that's very, very interesting. Of course, Bonacera and Rispaldo are teammates, so they'll be working hard together as Richard Coulomb loses the position to Kenneth Dummer in at the end of that exchange. As right now, Jos van der Ven is hoping for one of two things. A, a technical fault on Donald Fitterer's machine, or a technical fault on his hardware, either or it's going to make sure that he makes himself get home. But Van der Ven knows that he needs a little bit more than what he's got capable at the moment. Popsicle sticks then will go in the air. Two laps remain in the opening race here at Watkins Glen. And for the moment, it's not what Jos van der Ven needs because Fitterer has found the pace. 2.2 seconds only. I think it's going to be a consolation race for second at the moment. So we'll keep an eye on that one then as we head towards the final couple of laps, Neil. But he's still got some fantastic battles. Andrew Fiddler still not clear from Franz Brink. Still not clear of that gap, about four tenths of a second as they cross the line, as they just come out of turn one now. Certainly close enough for Franz Brink to have a shot at Andrew Fiddler uh, coming into uh, coming into uh, the bus stop chicane, as it appears like Bob Cairn uh, may well have had a little bit of an incident because he's just uh, came into the pits. In fact, no, I think he might be making his pit stop. Is he short? Has he underfueled that car? That's the only thing I can think of there for Bob Cairn, so that's going to be... Uh, disastrous and well he's going to be on for a long time and he's probably not set his fuel gauges he's just either gone now, yeah. and he's just managed to get himself through Spinner though that's Andrew Fiddler just talking about him in his battle there was contact between the pair Fiddler lo looped the rear end and somehow getting around all of that was Franz Brink who really had nowhere to go the way that Fiddler was spread eagle across the circuit there Neil not much he could do a Watkins Glen is a very, very narrow track at the best of times, and certainly nothing he could do. Oh, as uh, Paolo, Paolo Bonis, uh, sorry, uh, Gianni uh, Resperado. Uh, oh, I'm going to cut you off. Manning Gridden's had an off. And that one happening at the chicane. So right behind Van der Ven losing the rear, trying to apply the power back down into the tyres on the exit of the bus stop chicane. Manning Grinnan forfeits a podium as the white flag will now wave here in this opening race of the evening. Donald Fitterer with a 2.6 second advantage over Jos van der Ven, who is pretty much home and dry. John Morgan currently in third position, just driving a very respectable race here, but Franz Brink in what is sixth or fifth position now is under pressure for that top five because he's got John Unsby, who will take advantage of Franz Brink. And looking at Brink's vehicle, it looks okay for the moment damage-wise, but we'll see if he can hold himself off in the long and short. And for the moment, Unsby rattling through the gears, getting himself up the kilometers an hour, using the draft to his advantage, as now it's not 
quite defended just yet. Moving slowly to the middle of the circuit. Unsby picks the lane down on the inside. And I think Franz Brink doesn't have anything to fight that one. Great move from John Unsby. He moves himself up into the top five on the final lap then of this event. But it has been plain sailing at the front of the field for Donald Fitterer, who decided to pit in early here in this event to try and get himself a bit of fresh air and break the toe and the ability of advantage for Jos van der Ven. Van der Ven then had to fight Manning Grinnen throughout the majority of this race, and that was not helpful for either of them in terms of time. Fitterer has made sure that he's got himself to the perfect position possible as he rounds himself through turn 11. And finally, the difficult turn number 12. The 111 machine of Donald Fitterer will take race number one as Jos van der Ven will come home in second. Fitterer is once into winner's lane. Oh, it's just contact for fifth place between uh, Brink and Unsmith. Both of them are in the wall coming off of the boot. Wow, so both of them looking for the move. That was Brink diving for the inside, finding it second bit of respite, and he turns them both around. They both find the wall. I think Unsby hasn't lost a position at all, but a lot of positions lost for Brink, who is in that wall and effectively out of this event. So Unsby keeps that top five just for Andrew Fiddler, six, Respaldo, Bonacera just holding off Kenneth Duma. And there we see just how easily it can go wrong on the final lap. Yes, trying to do a little bit of a hero move, perhaps coming off of the boot on that final lap. And you, you only have that opportunity, perhaps, to get past uh, John Unsby. And it went terribly, terribly wrong for him. It certainly did, but classified results. Well, we'll get them up on your screen for them as the last vehicles look to charge over to the line. The final vehicle will be William Stark, but Donald Fitterer takes a vital, vital victory. He takes it by 2.3 seconds over Jos van der Ven. He made it plain sailing through the pit stop to get himself into position. John Morgan will round out the podium with a quiet drive ahead of Kenneth Baldwin, who challenged him starting 10th position and making great progress through the stops. John Unsby, a last lap instant, do not stop him in the end. He would still finish on the top five. Andrew Fiddler would chase him down for sixth with Gianni Rispaldo seventh, Paolo Bonacera in eighth place with Kenneth Duma in ninth and rounding out the top 10 would be Paul Hamilton. Richard Coulomb then onto the second page, finishes in 11th plus 10 day for Charles Gilly. He is there in 12th. Bruce Poole finishes 13th with Bob Kern 14th. Richard Valley and Ralph Kemmerer 15th, 16th with Jeff Cantor and William Stark, the last vehicles on the leading lap. Those who failed to finish, Franz Brink, Manning Grinnan, David Wy uh, Riley though was one lap down, as was Joel Martin. Romigo de Pasqua two laps down along with Wally Molesby. Larry Thomas three laps down, Jay Friels and Jared Florison failing to make it to the end of the race. Well, stay with us because we're going to take a very, very quick break here. When we come back, post-race interviews coming here from the circuit of Watkins Glen. And of course, the second race of the evening will be in full swing. Race one proved to be very, very entertaining indeed. And a lot of drivers looking for a lot of positions with opportunities opened up with the top two absent in the championship. Only one driver, though, could come home with the victory, and that's the man standing by with me right now, Donald Fitter. Donald, well, that one for you would probably be one of the most plain sailing races that you would have had the lead for the majority of the race, pitted in early to get out of Jos van der Ven's rhythm, and it seemed to work to perfection. 
That's exactly my strategy. I felt that I was more consistent than Joss, and I figured if I could just get him out of my draft, I might have a chance to stay ahead of him. And how difficult is it actually racing at Watkins Glen? Because we understand that this track is a drafting circuit. We know that sometimes when it is a drafting circuit, drivers who are maybe slightly slow when it comes to overall lap pace have the great equalizer, as it is sometimes known. Do you feel that in terms of breaking that one second at Watkins Glen, especially in these draft-dependent Pro Masters, do you feel that was vital towards your success today? I think what it did was gave me confidence to get the bus stop without uh, any sort of tragedy. Uh, I tend to have difficulty with dealing with somebody else while I'm trying to get through there. If it's just me, I can do it just fine. If I have somebody behind me or trying to pass, it just doesn't work out very well. Well, you have yourself a fantastic race win. Your first of the season and looking further forward, you were sixth in the championship, top two not here. What's the uh, aspiration then moving into the second race? Well, I'm not probably going to do the second race. I've got way too much of a personal life right now. Uh, I've got a girlfriend, and she and I just rode over a 1,000 miles in my Corvette over the weekend, and I'm making Ooh. her dinner. Well, it seems that it's a romantic weekend, and it's one where you get a victory, and you know what? You're going to celebrate it. Missing the second race. Classic when it comes to the 60+. plus. Well, Donald Fitterer, then, uh, before we let you go, any shout-outs to sponsors? I'd like to uh, shout out to uh, VRS and Julian for uh, making the setup that I used all week and his um, uh, tutorial. Uh, that really helped me get my uh, technique down in the bus stop. Those guys have done a great job. No worries at all. Donald Fitterer then coming home with the race victory. As Neil, you'll be standing by with the man who finished in second position, Jos van der Ven. And you're welcoming Jos van der Ven here. So uh, tell us, Jos. About uh, about your race, you had an almost race-long battle with uh, Manning Grinnan. Um, sorry, I didn't uh, understand it. Tell, tell us about your race. We saw for most of the race you were having a, a great battle for, uh, well, the lead and then second place with uh, Manning Grinnan. Tell, uh, tell us about that battle. Yeah, I was um, behind Manning after... Uh, uh, Donald made a, a pit stop, uh, which I didn't expect him to do uh, at that time. So um, that was a very close pit stop. But most of the race, I was uh, uh, after that, I was behind Manning, and I decided to do um, an earlier pit stop uh, because I had the feeling I was a little bit faster. So I wanted to get out of that battle. So, uh, coming into this uh, race, you were fourth in the championship, of course, with uh, Stefan Roskin and Bill Lawrence both not being here. That allows you to uh, gain some points on the uh, both of them. So, uh, uh, what is the plan for uh, race two? <laughs> well, uh, I can gain uh, five more points in race two uh, by winning it, so I guess that's the plan. Excellent, thank you, Jos. Jos van der Ven then coming home in second position. We also have the driver who came home in third, John Morgan. John, uh, quite a race for you in truth, really. You know, you didn't really have too much to worry about in the early stages. Most of it spent on your own. Just a little bit of a worry with Kenneth Baldwin behind coming towards the end, but no real concerns. Yeah, it was kind of lonely back there. The guys out front kind of ran away from me. Uh, coming out of the pits uh kenneth was there we had a we had a good battle for a few laps and uh i finally got to break away a little bit from him but it was a good race fun race uh do you feel that a lot of emphasis needs to go into uh the lap traffic maybe slightly with a couple of drivers getting involved in a few instances, maybe just checking up the natural flow of the race yeah, it's it's tough, but that's part of racing is, you know, sort of figuring out how to get through them safely. And, you know, a lot of they're running their own race and, uh, you know, there's always guys who can do better. But overall, I think they did pretty well. I think we uh, I didn't see any incidents where I was really would have been upset with a with a lapped uh, car. Well. You certainly find yourself with a good podium, and that's a solid platform uh, for you to build into that second race. Just what are you expecting to get then heading into this second race of the evening? 
Uh, the second one, I'd surely like to try to stay with that group in front, but that depends on if there's somebody behind you pressuring you. You, you have to be a little bit more defensive, and that'll slow you down a little bit. So just the same race would be good for me. Well, looking for the same race. John Morgan coming home in third position overall. Neil, we're looking towards this second race, and honestly... We, we had a very good battle for the opening race. Donald Fitter not turning up for this second one, so he's got his points and he'll run for the hills with them. So this second race is going to be very, very wide open. Indeed, yes. One of the uh, interesting points of this championship is that you only retain your best uh, best position from the two races. So uh, Donald Fitter are there deciding not to do race two because he's already got the maximum points available for the race for, for the weekend with 35. Jos van de Ven in second place there, obviously able to get five more points, will be pushing for that win. Uh, but yes, race two could be very, very interesting. Again, we've got a second uh, qualifying session, a second two lap qualifying session and with the qualifying session being that short who knows what could uh, who knows what it could bring up nobody quite knows what that is going to mean but for the moment we're going to step aside very briefly because race two will be coming up in the next five ten minutes or so stay with us here on racebot tv because this is going to prove to be an interesting race as we head over to our next session of qualifying and racing. We're back here at Autosports International 2017. From Vegas to Birmingham, we're now joined by driver for Apex Racing UK, who has 156 road wins and 11 oval wins. Graham Carroll, good afternoon. Yeah, hi Will, thanks for having me on. So I hear first of all you're a little bit poorly. Ah, uh, out in Vegas the second day I was there I sort of came down with a sort of cough, sort of flu sort of thing but we're, we'll get over it, we'll get over it. Talk about Vegas itself, I mean for me the one thing that stood out is how you and sim races were really kind of treated like races and given that kind of celebrity status quite a bit. I think the suits we were given and everything, you know, it was just absolutely amazing. Um, then to get a teammate like Jose Maria and Sam Bird and obviously everyone got their teammates as well. And um, I like you say, we were treated really, really well and it's not like we sort of turned up as gamers. All the uh, all the pro guys really sort of looked at us as competition and, and not just sort of gamers. So that was, um, it was good in that perspective and how they sort of organised the event and the sort of visa and um, how Formula E sort of worked it out, it was it was really good and ah, it was um, for the minute sort of me and Alex arrived on the Wednesday, I don't think we had sort of 10, 15 minutes to sit down, you know, the schedule was absolutely flat out but loved every minute of it, uh, apart from the race obviously, but the uh, nah, it was awesome and uh, hopefully it can sort of make sort of other competitions come out of it, you know, that's the, that's the big thing. Yeah, and I think one of the interesting things is going to be future of sim racing. That was really the first time that we saw the, I'm going to call it the LAN way of doing it, compared to what traditionally we have in iRacing with the everyone racing online. Do you think it's different? I mean, what Did you enjoy running in that kind of LAN setting more to iRacing? What's the pros and cons from your perspective? Look, I, I, I've always said that iRacing is the best of the best. Um, the only thing that drew me towards it was the money, you know, that's the, the only thing. But, um, I, there was, like, I was speaking to Gregor when we were out there as well, and he was one of the people that really hated, like, the input lag. It was one of the big things for everyone, and he really struggled with that. And But it was good, again, to see all these quick, really, really quick guys be on exactly the same machinery as everyone else and see who who's who and who can adapt to it the quickest. Um, and I've, that's, I've got to take my hat off to Bono. I've said that numerous, numerous times. He drove absolutely outstanding, you know. Um, so I know it was, um, there were some, some really, really good points, but there were some, some not so great points as well. But for sim racing as a whole, I think we need to get rid of, stop talking about the bad points about it and just talk about the positives because we're all trying to make this sim grow, uh, make, make sort of sim racing grow, and that's what we're, we're all trying to do together, you know. So that's the, that's the big picture here. Well... Let's move on and talk a little bit about your iRacing career. 
And of course, the, the key thing that we're going to start talking about is you participating again in the 2017 Racing World Championship Grand Prix Series. So for yourself, I mean, talking to Alex Simpson earlier on, and you are going to probably have the biggest team on the grid in 2017. Uh, we've definitely got a few quick guys coming up through the Pro Series. They're doing really, really well. Um, and uh, it's, we've, we've definitely got a strong team behind us. Again, myself, Alex and... Uh, Anton and Pete and uh, so many to name to be fair but it's it's going to be a good year and uh, it's, I'm looking forward to getting stuck back in about it and I think I uh, know that we've sort of uh, met all these guys in Vegas and seen what they're all about you know it's, it's time that Apex won a, won a race and got a pole and all this kind of stuff and I know I, know I said it going into last year's one I know it was my first WCS but we're, we're not here to finish second you know we're, we're, we're here to win them Ah, we, we want to be finishing right at the top this series and I'll do the first few rounds and if it if it's the Greg and Martin show again I think I'll be packing it in quickly <laughs> <laughs> well we're down to 12 rounds this season so compared to the 16 that we usually use in the I Racing World Championship Grand Prix Series and I've just been given a promo by Motorsport Auctions a global selling platform <laughs> yeah moving on um, so 12 rounds so the sense of urgency is a lot higher compared to previously because it means that all of a sudden you can't mess up. That's it, you know, I went into it as well. Um, first round last year, the uh, I can't even remember, one of the Iberica guys um, just completely wiped me out first round. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, second round, Phillip Island, I put my hand up, I, I had half a lap short of fuel. Um, and then Sebring, one of the Radicals guys, wiped me out. So, And then I went on a sort of bouncy uh, 10 Ah, well, numerous top 10 results that we did really you took the first three rounds out of the equation and just gave me a, an average top 10 I would have been ahead of Picala at one point you know so it's all ifs and buts but when you look at it like that that's what I want to make sure I've had my, my bad year to start with and now I kind of I need to know finishing and just points are the main thing you know you've got to learn off these guys that have done it for five years straight and um, it's time to, um, it's time to do well you know you talk about pole positions, of course. Radicals got themselves their first pole position last year in the Ice World Championship Grand Prix Series. NX Racing scored themselves their first win with Yeni Tamala in the World Championship Series. And one of the things that we saw with the McLaren is that, in many ways, it proved to be a leveller. So we, we heard all the stories with the Williams that, uh, oh, you know, the established teams have the advantage because they've been doing it for so long. The McLaren kind of wiped some of that out a little bit. So, do you think that you can get a pole position at the very least this season? Yep, I do. I do believe it now. It's time. We've got some new equipment. Hopefully, that'll help. And um, I know it's it's just the time. You know, we're not here to, like I say, I'm going to do the first sort of uh, say the first three or four rounds and and see how we get on. But I'm not here to um, be going about in tenth place or even or even third or fourth place, but 40 seconds off the lead. You know, that's just waste of time kind of thing so we're here to, we're here to win and do well and I think we've got the, the resources and the team this year to really do it you know that is a bold mission statement now we're going to hold you to that <laughs> race victories pole positions at a very minimum then for Apex and for Graham Carroll you talk about your setup actually talk us through the setup that you use for our racing that I use at home yeah well I've done a I sort of got a little sponsorship for the HE pedals for going out to Vegas um, so I've got myself a set of them coming shortly um, and I recently just bought a Leo Bodner steering system so I'd like to think you know the steering wheel on the pedals is probably the best you're going to get at the minute and ah, there's nothing else apart from the loose nut behind the wheel that's going to make it go quicker you know so <laughs> that's ah, I'm not that I've blamed any equipment in the past but just this, this is the year that we need to do well and ah, you know if there's a if there's a peak in my sim racing career where I've been doing well I think sort of this Vegas thing has really gave me confidence and um, I really pushing me forward to do well you know well let's talk a little bit more away from the world championship series first of all what else are you going to be doing on iRacing in 2017 there's a chance I maybe do Blanc Pan and um, the team, team of guys that are in there at the minute that I've spoke to Alex about maybe maybe jumping in but we'll see because I would never like to upset a team that's working well and going to qualify um, but we'll take it as it comes. Um, not a big deal if we don't. Um, and I, again, to be fair, it's just helping out Alex with stuff in the academy. I, I quite enjoy seeing drivers come through that and and picking up speed and getting better and better. Um, and I, to be, to be fair, any other competition that comes out there with cash, it's um, it's time to just attack it and treat it like Vegas. You know, like 
that was one of the things with Vegas. I treated it like a job. You know, I was yeah. on it six six hours a day, and that's why I won the first round. You know, I was ready to go, and and it really paid off. I know I never done well in the race, but I still still walked away with twenty thousand dollars. So any any competition that there is this year with uh, with cash prizes and a decent cash prize, I'll be all over it. All in for the money. Real race ring as well. Very quickly. I will see. Um, I developed a new Formula Ford car last year. Yep. Um, I'm not too sure if we're going to do it again, uh, possibly, but probably just the odd selected Formula Ford events, the big races here and there. And um, again, I'm, I'm making more money at sim racing than I am in real racing, so it's hard to hard to go real racing at the minute. <laughs> and well, that's one of the things, really. I want to before we finish up, talk about what you learn on iRacing to take into the real race track, but also what you learn on the race track that you can bring back to iRacing. I mean, how much of a link is there? The um Aye, put it this way, I stopped, I stopped real racing in 2008 um, when I ran it in money. I won the British Championship and I, I went away from it for quite a while. And I went back um, two years ago, 2015, I won one of the biggest Formula Ford races in the history. Uh, 150 entries, some of the best drivers in the world on Formula Ford. And I'd never have won that Formula Ford race without iRacing. And when you're battling with people and you're off, when you take off at the start or you're one to one and you're you're battling the guys, it is exactly the same parts of your brain you're using to that you would do in real life, you know, so it just keeps you ultra sharp, the, when you change the setup in the car, it's the feeling you're getting, it's exactly the same you're getting in real life, you know, so it just, it's so similar, you know, it's, um, don't get me wrong, there's there's slight things, tyre models and bits and bobs that you have to deal with, but the, the actual, the core of it is it's just exactly the same, and I race and do such a good job to, to replicate it, it's, um, it's just such a, a key tool to me, to be fair. Well, what I've learned from this interview is pretty simple. If there's money involved, if there's competition involved, you will see Graham Carroll going up there for championships, for prizes. Before we let you go, Graham, we'll leave the floor to you. Anyone want to give a shout out to? Ah, well, just thanks for iRacing to coming over. It's been, uh, it's been good to see everyone. Um, and again, Alex at uh, Apex Racing. Just again, for probably would never have been to Vegas and all these things without Alex. So, um, and I and all my family back home and the girlfriend. And ah, your, yourself, Will. Thank Cheers. you very much. Cheers, thank you very much. And thank you for stopping by here on iRacing Radio, powered by Racepot. You can come and see us at stand 6510 all weekend long. iRacing Radio, powered by Racepot. We're live from 9 a.m. till 6 p.m. on Saturday and Sunday. Tweet us. Use the hashtag iRacingRadio. We'll be back with more a little bit later on.
Ladies and gentlemen, 260 Plus Racing Adventures as now race two qualifying begins to set itself into motion. Two laps, 10 minutes to get yourself moving and a circuit at Watkins Glen, which has proven that it can have all the fun in the world attached to it. I am hashtag do you mind the observer of sim racing. Jake Sperry joined with Neil Heaty in the commentary booth. And you may have heard in the little 15 minute break that we had just previously, uh, more Scottish tones that we had as Team Redline's Graham Carroll uh, would be interviewed during that section with our very own Will Vincent. That, of course, happening last year at Auto Sport International. And well, right now, it feels like we've got a little bit of a waiting game happening right now here, Neil. Qualifying is where you set your marker. We're not going to get a back-to-back -back winner here in this one. we got no Donald Fitterer, but what we do have is a lot of drivers looking to score a lot of points. Yes, lots more drivers to, trying to get a load more points. As you say, 35 up for grabs here in race two. But yes, two-lap qualifying session means you really, have, you really don't have that uh, long to nail one of them so you could see a very shaked up grid here you certainly could see a shaken up grid but of course qualifying you've got to be absolutely perfect if you run off the circuit collect up one of those magic iris instant points you're not going to be able to set another lap time or you're not going to finish that lap time i should say as the first drivers look to set their times john morgan then is going to be the first driver let's go on board with the 177 let's also get up ourselves the speed graphic powered by ATVO, the official graphics engine here on racebot tv up through the s's 210 kilometers an hour moving up to 211 almost buffering in a sense the way that he has to just slightly turn that wheel you're trying to have as little friction as possible here neil as you head up those s's towards the bus stop chicane yes these fairly low-ish powered cars and such a gradient like coming up the S's and also having to turn at the same time so you almost stall out in terms of speed but coming through the carousel slight lift at the beginning just to make sure you can make it all the way around 135 miles an hour as he breaks for the first turn of the boot lovely there let it drift out ever so slightly being very very wary of those high high curbs though as he comes into the toe very very difficult and you have to wait forever until you get the power on. Yeah, this is no Herman Tilker design track. You're not going to get friendly curbs. You can cut by three miles. You're not going to get 15 acres of runoff area. Oh, no. You've got to make sure that you get it absolutely pinpoint perfect. Almost street circuit-like in the appeal here, in the character makeup that you see of Watkins Glen. Through turn number 10, you're off Gamba Corner. Getting very nicely onto the curb, over uh, the service bridge, and now into turn number 11. Slightly hitting the power at 200 plus an hour get on the brakes for the final corner very shallow in that line from John Morgan he pushes very very wide on the exit of course you can't take any liberties with that exit as he crosses the line 1436 then the benchmark for the moment Paul Hamilton goes well Bob Kern does a 437 Jos van der Ven 143 flat just like that puts himself on pole position with Kenneth Duma now up into second yes that 143 flat is about a quarter of a second faster than the race one qualifying time well, that's all you need to know there. So certainly a lot of pace for Jos van der Ven. He's found a little bit more. Manning Grinnen, I believe, has had a crash on his opening lap. So he will be looking to set a time on his second qualification lap. So a lot of drivers looking to get some pretty big times in. Your top five at the moment is van der Ven, Duma, Morgan, Brink and Kern. Andrew Fiddler currently in sixth position going over the grass. He will not do any more laps when it comes to qualifying but still those times are looking to be sorted as things stand it will probably be Manning Grinnan who will set the final qualifying time 
of anybody in this field. So we'll keep an eye out for him. He'll be the last vehicle across the line. John Morgan, though, still third position looking to make that charge. Keep an eye, though, on Bob Kern in the number six just behind him as he heads himself into the heel of the boot, trying to get up on the power here, Neil. And it's off camber, turn 10. We saw a big accident in practice, but we know that you've got to get that one absolutely right. We saw it in race one. Yeah, we, we have to get that corner absolutely right. We saw it in race one in the last lap. You can even have instance there if uh, the car behind is a little bit too aggressive as Bob Kern comes through turn number 12. A far, uh, far neater line, if you like, coming across the line. And he doesn't go any faster. He's a tenth slower on lap two. So that 43.763 is all that he's going to do as Franz Brink comes dangerously close to stealing that pole position away from Jos van der Ven. Just over a tenth of a second with a 43.17. Oh, and Jos van der Ven did not go any quicker either. So all eyes turn to Manning Grinnan, who has not set a lap time just yet. 43 flat to beat as he powers his way through turn number 11. All of the power needed and a little bit more on the brakes, opens up the corner, maybe a little bit tentative with that curl on the outside, not using all of the track, but charges to the line. Manning Grinnan does a 43-163, moves himself to the front row, but Jos van der Ven, for the moment at least, is going to be safe. The only driver who can now affect things is Gianni Respaldo, but Respaldo certainly hasn't shown any inclination of pace so far this weekend. Aaron Grinnan is on his second qualifying lap now, coming out of the S's across the top of the hill at 220 kilometres an hour, coming down towards the bus stop. As Gianni Respaldo, as you said, the other car, who was uh, quite strong in race one, just coming out of the toe of the boot now. And of course, only two laps to set. Everyone else has set their lap time. Someone like Jos van der Ven will now use the remaining time for practice to make sure that he's got his lines A and OK. Gianni Respaldo then making that charge. He heads himself into turn number 10. He has another lap, though, after this that he can use. And he's got time here. It's 10 minutes the cutoff, not 10 minutes. And you get yourself uh, time to finish your lap in this style of closed qualifying. So Gianni Rispaldo rounds himself through the final corner, makes the charge then to the line, and we'll see what sort of benchmark he can put in. And Rispaldo across the line does himself a 144 flat. So that puts him in 15th position at the moment. And currently only two tenths of a second, even a quarter of a second would put him inside that top 10. So he knows what he needs to find. It's a very, very condensed grid right now. The top 15 split by one second as things stand. Incredibly, incredibly close grid here at 60 Plus Racing Adventures as Gr Manning Grinnan comes out of turn 12. Coming across start finish line. What is his lap this time around? I don't think he's going to set one here. If no, I'm going to be I don't honest. think so. Um, no, I think he, he must have got a one X in that lap, I believe. Well, I believe he's out of laps, so I don't ah. think more times are going to count for Manning Grinnan. So. Grinnan not going to get anything more than that, so it will only be Gianni Rispaldo who will set a time here, Neil, as he heads through the shoot. Yep, Gianni Rispaldo heading through the uh, heading through the shoot down towards the toe of the boot. Very, very difficult corner. He's done quite well to keep it on the concrete on the inside, just washing out ever so slightly there. I could hear him having to make a little lift. Yeah, he certainly did have to lift there, and that's not going to be ideal for Espado, who hits the brakes, finds his markers, and heads into the heel of the boot. Nice and tight there towards the curb. That was a perfect corner from Gianni Respaldo as he now looks at trying to open out the corner, but he just can't get that vehicle into where he needs to. So Respaldo again, just having to miss slightly a few corners. That's going to cost him maybe a tenth every single time he misses an apex and he heads through the final corner, hits it nicely, tries to get the power down, not smooth, had to take two stabs of the throttle as he charges his way over to the line in the number 48 machine. He does go quick but only on time he was seven thousandths of a second off of finding himself more positions everyone done in qualifying grid as follows
Jos van der Ven and Manning Grinnen share the front rows. They were second and third last time and were battling close together, but it was just a tenth of a second the difference between the pair. Franz Brink, 7,000 back, will start in third with Kenneth Baldwin fourth. John Unsby will start this one from fifth position with Kenneth Duma. Fantastic qualifying from him in sixth. John Morgan will start seventh with Bob Kern in eighth with row five consisting of Bruce Poole and Remigio de Pasqua. Row six sees Jay Friels and Andrew Fiddler as Joel Martin and Gerard Florison will start 13th and 14th, both having races to forget in race one. Gianni Raspado will finish within one second of your race lead, or your pole sitter, sorry, shall I say, in 15th place with Charles Gilly in 16th, Paul Hamilton and David Riley are 17th and 18th. Fred McIntosh, Ralph Kemmerer, Richard Coulomb, and Wally Molesby, 21st and 22nd. William Stark, Larry Thomas, and Richard Valley failing to set a lap time here. And once more, we will have one pace lap to set off proceedings. And sometimes, you know, when you see a pace car, when it comes to an open wheel format, some say, oh, just let them race, just let them race. But ultimately, I think sometimes the pace car can be a good decision, Neil. It opens out the field. It makes life a little bit easy to make runs into the opening corners. But what it also does is it prevents incidents. Indeed, uh, with a rolling start, the leader can choose when to put in the throttle. So the uh, car seems to be tend to be a little bit more spread out as they come down to the first corner, as opposed to a standing start. Well, you all have to know that Jos van der Ven is not going to take halves with this race. He's going to try and get everything he possibly can to put himself into a great position. Traditions have not changed one iota. So it's effectively where it was in that opening race. And they all have to get themselves over that line. A few disappointing qualifyings, though. Andrew Fiddler, I was expecting a little bit more out of him, maybe to just charge up through that field. But of course, with time comes a lot of opportunity to make those moves, and he'll be looking to capitalize on those who are maybe slightly out of position. Yes, 16 laps to make a move here at the Watkins Glen boot layout as they all peel off for the formation lap of race two with Jos van de Ven on pole position. Manning Grinnen right beside them. Those two had a fantastic battle in race one. No doubt they can repeat it here in race two. No doubt indeed, but that comes down to how they drive. And for the moment, at least, there's gonna be a lot of anticipation when you roll off on this start. And well, been looking at these drivers, all thinking about how this one is going to play out. I think a lot of drivers know that they just want the clean finish, clean result, try and gain on some positions and some points that they didn't get in the opening race. But they will understand that if they do crash out of this one here in the second race, they do have, uh, shall we say, a pickup. So would you say that promotes maybe more aggressive racing here in this second race, knowing you've got a result in the back? I think perhaps uh, between the people who were, say, 10th or lower in race one, of course, it's your best result from these two races that go count towards your championship. So for perhaps those who felt they were under felt they underachieved so perhaps those who were involved in instance in race one are going to be battling even harder here in race two but in terms of the front runners such as van der ven grinnen brink baldwin uh, john morgan they might be taking a little bit more easy as they know they've got a good points haul in the bag already if they get more points so be it that's fantastic but it's not certainly the end of the world uh, it's certainly not the end of the world at all. So, Jos van der Ven, just about getting those points. He came into this event maybe just a little bit further down in the championship than maybe he would have liked. He has certainly met his match over the course of this season so far. Surprising to hear that, actually, uh, out of van der Ven. See him so much down in the championship. As far as things stand, he comes into this one. Uh, Jost van der Ven a lot further down than many people would have expected. Fourth behind John Unsby. He has moved up ahead of Unsby, ahead of Lawrence as well. But he needs to find a result that gets him the opportunity that he wants to see. Heel of the boot, though, coming up for these drivers. 
someone like Kenneth Baldwin, who was very, very impressive starting 10th in the opening race, starts this one from third or fourth position on the grid, as we believe that Franz Brink there on the outside could have a really good shot at this one, has certainly looked aggressive through the race and is not afraid to make that move. Of course, we saw that last lap instant from him. We'll see if that turns into something as the pace car rounds himself through the penultimate corner. The iRacing Roof First safety car of all things. And don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, you can get social with us here on RaceBot TV via Facebook or the Twitter machine. But the pace car will dive down onto pit road. And Van der Ven goes. Green flag. 16 more laps then. Underway. Slow getaway for Manning Grin. And he's already leapfrogged by Franz Brink. And now John Unsby looking to leap Kenneth Baldwin into the 90. And they are both going to get their desired effects and results. But not quite. John Unsby is Kenneth Baldwin. Comes very, very close to making contact up the S's section. Losing the draft all the way. The longer they stay too wide. And now Kenneth Duma wants in on this one. All clean so far. Yes, Duma certainly does want a shot at that as Unsby. And I think that as Baldwin goes side by side, coming up towards the bus stop chicane for the first time round, they're still side by side, but Baldwin allows Unsby the place for now. For now, indeed, as the racing looks to just heat up slightly as now Manning Grinnan will try and get back at Franz Brink. This one for second position. Defensive line taken by Brink into the shoot. That will compromise his exit run over to the toe of the boot. And constantly are looking to set this one up corner after corner after proverbial corner. And there we see a little bit of a different line being taken. Brink only just being able to put the power back down, diamonding off the corner as now Manning Grinnan looks to maybe have a charge at the inside. Not close enough to make a decisive move, but still showing that he's got an eclectic amount of pace. Grinning want to, wanting to reclaim that second position that he lost in that start. It seems to be a little bit slow to react to me, and that's how he lost that second place uh, starting position. But yes, coming through the penultimate corner for the first time now, the turn 12, the wall right there on the outside, ready to suck you in if you make a little bit of a mistake. But it seems that the top uh, 10 or so have done no such thing. Jos van der Ven leads the first lap here in race two. And we already start talking about strategy here and who wants to make a move, who doesn't now as draft becomes oh so vital for a lot of drivers in this field. Andrew Fiddler, for example, who's looking to get around Bob Kern to move himself inside the top 10. Not really too many movers in the early stages, but your top five are now breaking into two packs, one of three, one of two. And now here's the look from Franz Brink, who dives down to the inside, goes for the gap that didn't really exist. And now look at this around the outside, tried Manning Grinnan, not going to find it. Franz Brink with a fantastic move, prizing the gap open like a thief. He forced that Pro Master car into a gap that was about only about three quarters of a Pro Master width. I have no idea how he managed to do that. Going right on the inside, almost getting those right hand wheels on the grass under braking for the bus stop chicane. And a fantastically brave move there from Franz Brink. And Franz Brink now trying to break away from Jos van der Ven, trying to get as many points as possible. John Unsby on the rear now in fourth. All of that checking up has brought the train to become a train of five at the front. To keep an eye on what happened with Andrew Fiddler, he definitely did get past Bob Kern. So he's now up inside of your top ten. Four, well, three vehicles on pit road now as William Stark, Wally Molesby and Fred McIntosh all from the rear of the field. So they've been involved in a major incident towards the back. McIntosh calling it down done so the rear of the field not looking very very comfortable at all with this one but right now Kenneth Duma working hard and actually in comes Kenneth Baldwin here who I think probably would have a penalty in this situation or he's put qualifying fuel in I'd say it's a fairly brave move to pit in at this point 14 that's Van der has gone around oh, in second no. place Wow, and that was Jos van der Ven just trying to put the power down through the 90. The back stepped out. He went spread eagle. Somehow it was avoided by Manning Grinnan. He got himself off of the racing surface and gets himself back going behind David Riley. Disaster for van der Ven, who will now look to be overtaken by Ralph Kemmerer. There was no contact in any of that, though, for van der Ven. So that will be the only respite that he will have 
in that machine. So for Jos van der Ven, he will look to come straight back at it against Ralph Kemmerer. Kemmerer maybe a little bit weaker at the moment, but van der Ven very comfortable just sitting and waiting behind. What this means at the front, though, is that it's still going to be uh, Franz Brink leading, but Kenneth Doomer all of a sudden is up into second. Yes, Kenneth Doomer, Doomer up into second after Manning Grinnan had to take some avoiding action from the spinning Dutchman there at turn one. But uh, everyone checking up for that incident means that Kenneth Doomer has gone into second place, but then it's everyone for second behind him. Yeah, and Franz Brink now can run to the hills and try and get himself away. The train stretches back all the way to Joel Martin in 12th position. Well, now 11th position out on circuit. 10 car scrap for second place here on the second lap as now Manning Grinnan looks to apply the pressure on the 07 of Duma. And Duma, for the moment, understands this. You're at the front of a big train. There's a mistake. There's a bit of contact between the pair of them. Duma now having to check up, and that's going to drop him down the train. There's one position. There's two. There's a third, and probably a fourth as well, as Fiddler's going to find his way by as they make the run to the 90. Make the run to the 90. Indeed, that small, small mistake, especially when you're in such a big pack that you get like Kim Watkins down in these low-powered cars. It is extremely, extremely costly. He was in second position before turn 12. He's now down in sixth. Well, it goes just like that, and Bob Kerr and his teammate under a lot of pressure. Here's Bruce Paul looking down to the inside, trying to find something to happen. And for the moment, he's got a nose. He's got a car length alongside. They'll go too wide, and he'll now have to open up the corner because here comes Jay Friels looking for an opportunity around the outside of the carousel. Contact. Don't often make it happen, and there is contact. There's uh, the pass going around. Yeah, the going around at, uh, on the carousel, and I believe it was contact with the dropping like a stone Kenneth Doomer. Oh no, it was with Fiddler actually. So ah. there was Fiddler. He was on the inside trying to go through. Not enough room on that inside, but not enough room really being given there, I felt, by De Pasqua. So contact there sends De Pasqua off. Not what he wanted as he was having a fantastic run up five positions at the time. So now they've just got to calm down, start working together as there's a big lunge from, uh, I believe that's John Martin on the lap traffic of Molesby and there's an instant behind. Off goes Gerard Florison, off goes Richard Coulomb in all of that one. And they were checking up there. That was all Florison versus Hamilton in the end. And Hamilton just carrying a bit too much there. Florison maybe a little slow on the apex. Yeah, Hamilton, uh, Hamilton I think... Um... I, I know what you see, yep, yep, perhaps a little bit slow in the apex there because Paul Hamilton just went square into the back of him. So perhaps, uh, perhaps a little bit of a moment there for the car in front and Hamilton just didn't anticipate it. Gap at the front is 3.333 as they cross the line. Lucky number much, Franz, but at the moment he's got that over Manning Grinnan, close to 10th over that last lap. Battle going on though for P6, here's Bob Kern. Look how much pressure he is under by Bruce Paul behind that Jay Friels, behind that John Martin. Looking to get in on this one and they start fanning out. Two wide, three wide, thread the needle time. And he gets Ooh. just enough room, but he has to check it up. They were interlocking wheels into the corner. Jay Friels is a lucky man to be alive. That was almost a code brown for all three of them there, but yes, Friels, a very lucky man to be alive as Bob Cairn is leading this pack coming out of the carousel. He's the one who's on top. Well, you don't get much closer than that when it comes to Pro Mazda Racing, and Jay Friels just tested the limits and anything could have happened in that situation. Second through fifth right now. We'll get a graphic up for you. Your biggest movers and shakers inside your top ten right now. Andrew Fiddler is plus seven at the moment. Plus six for Charles Gilly, who is up into tenth position, leading the third train as Paul Hamilton with a damaged front wing under pressure from Gianni Raspaldo trying to go down the inside. But that's a bit too deep there from Hamilton. Here comes Raspaldo straight back, though. Going to change the lanes, cross the beams, go to the inside and... Very reminiscent now of the final corner at Sepang, unable to make that work. Yes, just unable to make that work. An interesting passing opportunity there, if you can make it, but it requires a lot of cooperation from both parties as Manning Gurinen stays in second place over the Super 70s Championship leader, John Unsby, who's right on his tail. 
And the number 48 machine has uh, been involved. Gianni Respaldo, a crash at the final corner. That one involving Richard Coulomb. So Respaldo getting no respite. Just gets turned one, two bits of contact. And Coulomb goes up and over as a consequence. Five, six barrel rolls. That's a scary, scary incident there for Richard Coulomb, who eventually self right but he'll be out of this event effectively in terms of getting himself on the leading lap. But still, Manning Grinnan managed to close down about half a second over that last lap. 43-1, he's dragging everyone with him. But Andrew Fiddler sets the fastest lap of the day so far. 142.9 in the turn. 42.9, absolutely fantastic lap. We saw, uh, we saw uh, Donald Fisher in race one do that by himself. To do it in the toll. I'm not sure, it could well be as impressive because of course you have got the extra speed boost on the streets, however, this uh, dirty air from the cars in front certainly does not help you through these fast turns, such as the carousel, such as the 90, such as the final turn. Uh, but yes, Manning Grinnan appears to have lost a little bit of time to John Unsby there through the boot, that time round here in lap 6. Then to go. Well, you're certainly seeing that 10 laps to go when they cross the line as John Morgan, for the moment, trying everything to stay with Unsby, but probably has a mirror full of Fiddler, and that's not going to be helpful at all in the slightest. But look at the pace that they are starting to run. They are running faster than the race leaders, and I'm not surprised to see the gaps maybe starting to stretch a little bit. Grinnan, another four tenths of a second locked off here. 43 2, a 42 9 that time from John Morgan. 42 7 from Andrew Fiddler, who again goes purple in the toe and he's got three vehicles of tow as he now maybe is starting to think about okay can i make this move here on john morgan can i get a position but every time he tries to close there's more draft that's available and he'll have to check up and wait as unsby thinks about making a move for second but decides no i'm against it for now Unsby third place in the championship coming in a fantastic run for Unsby in that in that uh, in that 61 car at the moment just sitting there behind Manning Grinnan perhaps just biding his time uh, before Grinnan makes his pit stop or will perhaps John Unsby be the first to blink and come in. Well, it's a waiting game, and they all know that it's a waiting game, and they've got to make sure that they get the right choices. There is a little bit of traffic that they are starting to encroach on. Richard Valley, Richard Coulomb, William Stra uh, Stark, they can all start hitting in on, but they know that they just want to close down that gap. They've got to start slightly working together here, and all of a sudden, Andrew Fiddler is starting to struggle with the train and maybe starting to fall off the back here in this battle going on for fifth place. Got side-by-side -side action as Paul Hamilton now under pressure. Here's Ramigo de Pasqua. There's a bit of contact, and Paul Hamilton will go for a slide. He'll hold it together, and there it was very, very narrow. Hamilton maybe had a little bit more room he could use, but ultimately he loses the position. Ultimately losing that position as you said and yet the top five still not coming in for their pit stop. I thought Andrew Fiddler might have done to come in to get some clean air but he's deciding no he's going to stay on the rear end of the pack in that 101 car. And that pack closed down nine tenths of a second on that last lap on Franz Brink, who's starting uh, to be on the brink of losing that race lead. He is under so much pressure here, and you're starting to see his lap time seize up a little bit in terms of times. He did a 43.2 on the second lap. Well, that's starting to fall away now. 43.6, 43.6, 43.9. Six, his last three lap times that he's got. Compare that to Manning Grinnan. 43.1, 43.2, 43 flat. Certainly a lot quicker right now is Grinnan, who is showing that pace to be a leader in this event keep an eye on van der ven as well further back in the pack he's currently in 17th position chasing down kenneth duma at the moment but for now at least franz brink under immense amounts of pressure as now john morgan starting to drop back from john unsby he may think about pitting Indeed, perhaps just trying to get that little bit of a gap so he, uh, so he can come into the pits unhindered. But yes, uh, Grinnan taking almost a full second out of Brink that previous lap as he come and rejoin the short track. Uh, coming down towards the penultimate corner. The question is, is any are any of them going to come in this time round? We're about to end the lap eight, which means we're just at the halfway point of the race. And it looks in. like Franz Brink is coming in. 
Again, he was using all of mine in. He wasn't going to be aggressive and late go on to lane. He used all of the line, and this is going to allow us to be here a chance to go down to the inside as he battles for the race lead with Manning Grinnan. Almost carbon copy of Grinnan versus Jos van der Ven. He makes the move, but has he compromised himself now on the exit? Because the run will go all the way to Manning Grinnan up the S's section, and there's just about enough room as they head to turn three. Room being given by Unsby, who checks the run, and that's going to allow Manning Grinnan a chance to go straight back. But the fourth corner always favours the driver on that outside through three. And now here we go. Battle of the bravest. John Alacy, battle of the late breakers. Latest breaker is certainly John Unsby. And he holds on with a fantastic move. A fantastic move there from Unsby being set up all the way from turn 11. Getting a good run out of there through 12 and be able to make that pass into turn 1. But Manning Grinnan is not uh, losing that lead lightly. He tries to go around the outside of the first corner in the boot. That would be a very, very impressive move if he could uh, pull it off. But indeed he does not and that allows Unsby to continue in the provisional lead of this race. Yes, but you have to remember they're all fighting off against Franz Brink and every time they go side by side and check each other up it allows them to get back into this one i wonder if anyone will decide to play a game of chase and get themselves down onto the lane as soon as possible into turn number 10 then and a big wide line from manning grin and trying to open up the exit potentially towards turn number 11. you also got to be wary about engine temperatures as well in these sorts of vehicles it's so easy just to have that engine overheat on you. So I think everyone being a little bit wary and grinning on cue, dives down to lane. He gets joined by Fiddler, who is so much more aggressive. Indeed, the two of them seem to come in on the at the end of lap nine. Just seven laps to go for uh, for these cars now here at Watkins Glen. And this race is almost gone in a flash. John Unsby still in the provisional lead of this race. And I say provisional because he has yet to make his pit stop. The question is, where will Mr. Brink be? when they finish this. The gap between the two of them, we will see when Brick comes across the line now. And currently he is 30.7 seconds behind Dunsby. Well, look at this. Here comes Brink coming out of the final corner and onto circuit is Manning Grinnan, who needs to get up to pace. I feel like Brink is going to get the draft. Only the fringes, though, at 2.13k, because Grinnan already up to pace. As they now start charging Fiddler side by side with Kenneth Baldwin, who's got to come down and make another stop. He can't make it to the end from lap number two. Surely he can't, as he came in incredibly, incredibly early. Baldwin's going to attack, though. No, he's not. He's going to sit behind, but Franz Brink is there all thereabouts with Manning Grinnan. Now that's good news for John Unsby. He knows now that he can come in, make that stop, and potentially get out with Manning Grinnan and a train in tow. So Unsby knows he's got work to do if he wants to come in. So does John Morgan. Potentially, but all it all matters about these clean air laps that both of them are setting at the moment. Well, all four of them, all five of them are setting at the moment. It's just depending on how fast these few laps are. Unsby and Morgan coming round the final Animal. turn now. Neither of them deciding to come in the pits. Jos van der Ven has had a spin. He was trying to get around Bob Kern. He did, but he looped it around, carrying too much momentum. Almost getting a tag as well as he looked to try and get himself back up to pace. In fact, he decides that he'll take the turn. I think Van der Ven's race is all but over in terms of getting more points. John Unsby, though, stays out, as does John Morgan. Their times on that last lap were a 43.6 and a 43.5, respectively. Keep an eye on Manning Grinnan's times as he was the driver who came down over the course of the last laps. Also, he did a 204 outlap. 43.9 for Franz Brink, who certainly lost time on this lap that has been very, very visible, lost himself about half a second. So we could estimate maybe about 43.3 at the moment for Manning Grinnan. So I think that Unsby does not have the pace here to retain the race lead. He needs to find a couple of tenths. Yes, he's about a couple of tens, but again, it is so, so close between the two of them. The gap between Grinnan and Unsby almost exactly 30 seconds when they both came across the line to begin at lap 11. In race one, the latest we saw stops, I think, was at the end of lap 13, if memory serves me correctly. So we'll see Unsby and Morgan come in within the next couple of laps and we'll really get to see who is in the lead of this race. But really, at the moment, it's a toss-up between Unsby and Grinnan. 
Bruce Paul runs off the circuit at the chicane. He was eyeing up a move on Bob Kern, but the eyes were bigger than the belly. And Bruce Paul will now have to pass on pudding, I think, after that sort of move. So not quite there. We'll see if anyone dives down the lane. Here comes John coming in. The and both are. So John Morgan, look how more aggressive Morgan is. And look at that. So early was John Unsby onto pit road, onto the limiter, that John Morgan really didn't have anywhere to go in that situation. Trap map is up between the 61 of Unsby, the 47 of Manning Grinnan, but we saw how Unsby was so pedestrian coming onto that lane. It's checked up Morgan, who probably would have wanted to go around the outside, had no room to do so. It is pretty much a one-track pit entry here, as also diving down off of the lane is Richard Coulomb. Here will come, though, Manning Grinnan, as off and away goes John Morgan. Grinnan heading towards turn number one and Morgan. home free. So Morgan trying to get on the pace. He's jumped in the stops. He's behind Brink. He's side by side with the likes of Fiddler, who's got himself past one and splits the pair. The Fiddler splitting the pair, but he goes up the inside of John Morgan through turn three. That turns to the outside for turn four, but of course, uh, Fiddler has these fresh, warm tires, so there's always got temperature in them. He can take more risks as they're two by two coming into the chicane. And they hold it together nicely there, Noah's Ark. And now they come out of the section there. You've got also Kenneth Baldwin, maybe not so much of a factor in this one, but still proving that he's got pace. Unsby, Morgan, Fiddler, Brink and Grinnan, your top six are currently split by next to nothing at all on circuit. Romigo de Pasqua also came down in onto lane. He's behind Bob Kern and Joel Martin. But this leading train, all the battling's happening at the rear of it right now. John Morgan just trying to find a bit of air so he can go and attack Andrew Fiddler, who he thinks he's quicker than. Yeah, he thinks he's quicker than him. The question is, is he? Of course, the, uh, the draft gives you a little bit of a false sense of security that you're faster than someone, especially around the track as fast, as flat out as, what, as Watkins Glen here. They're coming onto the short circuit, and that's a touch in the wall, isn't it? That's Kenneth Baldwin's touch in the wall, just pushing a little bit too hard. Gets himself into the arm coat, and you can see that his steering absolutely oh, yes. shot is the suspension. So Kenneth Baldwin, it goes from bad to worse, having to come down onto pit road incredibly early, and now he's going to be diving for pit road incredibly, incredibly late. So with five laps to go, oh. now four laps to go, it's going to be Kenneth Baldwin it's on the lane and out in the commitment cone. In, inevitably get sacrificed in that situation. As Andrew Fiddler has lost a couple of places there, he's now behind John Hunsby in fifth place because he almost went to Narnia coming into turn one. Incredibly, incredibly wide. And he had to slow it all the way down and he's lost two positions to Morgan and Hunsby. Oh, he certainly has. And well, he's certainly got a line, a witch and a wardrobe now on the back of his machine now that he doesn't have the draft. So for Andrew Fiddler, he understands. He knows that he has lost the draft. He needs battling to get back into the race for the podium and maybe a race victory as well if things go kaput. I remember seeing a Pro Mazda race here, an official race which saw the top five drivers at the toe of the boot, Neil, all crash in the same corner at exactly the same time. Anything's possible at the Glen. Anything can happen in racing, and it normally does. That's the joy of it. But Manning Grinning, still in the lead of this race, was about a second when he came across the start-finish line to begin this lap 13. And the estimate is still about a second. Franz Brink in second. Fiddler running at the podium, but John Morgan and John Ansby are right. Sorry, uh, Fiddler uh, had that incident, of course. Sorry, Morgan is now in third place. Ansby right on the rear wing of him. Again, well, they're starting to lose the draft of Franz Brink. Brink starting to lose the draft of Manning Grinnan, and this is starting to just spread out slightly. The podium certainly not secure. Unsby needing some consistent points, and now currently 1.1 seconds is Morgan off of Brink, who is 1.1 off of Manning Grinnan. So Grinnan turning the screw, maybe stopping the drop of the draft as now Unsby gets a good run through the 90. Up the S is actually topped up underneath then he is and you can see it's 18k to 23k starting to really pile on the power 232 looked for the inside there was no line goes to the outside to make the move with three laps remaining and gets it done because it's given by John Morgan 
wait for a better opportunity later on, but already Ooh. half a second lost. And off. Is it Fred? That's, that's Grinnan, that's the race leader. Wow, and Manning, Grinnan, has thrown away another one late. He was a little bit concerned by the spinning Kulom in front. He had to get out of it there. It was right on the racing line. Kulom, no contact, mind you, but Manning, Grinnan, spinning it, worried about making contact. Grinnan now drops himself back to fifth position, and all of a sudden, Franz Brink, who led the early stages and was clawed back three seconds, is back in the lead of this one by about a second. Yes, yeah, so that promotes John Unsby, uh, so that promotes John Morgan to that final podium place now. Now, can Franz Brink hold on to that win, or will John Unsby be able to close that gap again? The gap between the two of them, just over a second. I've got two laps and two corners to go. Well, it was closed three tenths of a second over the last lap. Franz Brink got that gap closed to 1.1 seconds. I expect that gap to come down a little bit more as he pushes incredibly hard through the final corner and move it hard to the inside, trying everything to break the toe as much as he can. The gap is now seven tenths of a second. Franz Brink started third, Unsby fifth, Morgan seventh. And right now your top four split by just four seconds at the moment. Manning Grinnan is nine seconds now off of your lead. He is not going to play a factor in the end of this one as popsicle sticks are in the air and Franz Brink now will feel the wrath, the breath of Unsby underneath his collar. We are certainly setting up for a grandstand finish here at Watkins Glen. John Unsby now right under the rear wing of Brink as he comes through the inner loop. Oh, he's lost it. Oh, Brink's lost it! Brink's lost it coming out of the inner loop exactly like what Grinnan did the lap before. That's promoted Unsby to the lead. Unbelievable. Franz Brink has thrown away a race victory opportunity. He had the chance. He was under pressure. He was defending early. He showed all the signs of weakness and ultimately he pays the price now it lies on John Unsby third in the championship coming in his rivals two of them not here one having an incident and effectively out of this race he now knows it's only John Morgan who can stand between him and a race victory with one and a third laps to go John Morgan needs something here to close down John Unsby. Other battles on circuit include Bob Kern versus Bruce Paul, Jay Friels waiting in the wings, Charles Gilly against Joel Martin who has made a mistake over the course of this lap. We'll keep an eye on those ones but the big one of course is Unsby versus Morgan as the white flag comes out to signal one final lap at Watkins Glen this evening and the gap for John Unsby to defend is six tenths of a second. No nonsense now between the two Johns. Unsby versus Morgan. Morgan a little bit wider through that opening corner trying everything to bring that draft back down hoping that he's got one final chance to make it happen and he's closing that gap down. It's under half a second now under four tenths under three tenths of a second but is he going to run out of time to go and make that move? It's now two tenths it's now one tenth. He'll move to the outside to try and make the move as they come to the chicane. But he thinks better of it and waits for a better opportunity. The heel of the boot, perhaps, if he can continue with a great run as the big wide line taken by Unsby is to open up the corner through the carousel, heading towards the shoot. For Morgan, if he can't do it at the heel, he's got a chance at turn 10. And then he is running out of options. He could go for the Michael Conti pass at the final corner, but that is certainly not advised to the heel of the boot. The pair of them come along and right now, nothing separating these two veterans of sim racing. And now you look at Morgan. He's seeing a slightly defensive line being taken by John Unsby. He thinks that he's close enough and Morgan feigns a look to the inside. Maybe a little bit wide on the line there from John Unsby. He's got to be careful here into turn number nine. He knows there could be a chance. Little feign of a look, but it's not quite there. Unsby now, no mistakes on the exit. No mistakes for the final two corners of this event and John Unsby I think is home and dry with one corner to go John Unsby rounds the final corner there is no mistake there is no mistaking this though John Unsby has taken a fantastic victory at Watkins Glen last man standing
That's all racing is sometimes. Sometimes you just need to keep your car out of trouble and you will come back with an absolutely great result. And that's exactly what John Unsby did here in race two. As he said, last man standing and he brings home the victory. He certainly does. Great scrap to the line though. Bob Kern under pressure and he's not going to quite get too wide. Jay Frills tried. He wasn't quite close enough. What a fantastic second race that we have been greeted to and classified results are going to be as follows. John Unsby holds on three tenths of a second in the end. The last man standing from everyone making mistakes late in this event. Many opportunities, but he goes from fifth to first to take the victory ahead of John Morgan, who started second, seventh. Andrew Fiddler finishes on the podium, starting 12 plus nine, having a fantastic run with Manning Grinnan, spinning with three laps to go. Franz Brink with two to go, would also spin. That would drop him down to fifth position with Kenneth Duma finishing sixth. Remigio de Pasqua finishes seventh, ahead of Bob Kern, who led a train home. Jay Friels, Bruce Poole, Charles Gilly, and Joel Martin in that train, along with Gianni Rispaldo and Gerard Florison. David Riley finishes 15th position with Ralph Kemmerer in 16th. Vehicles a lap down include Wally Molesby, Richard Coulomb, and Richard Valley and William Stark. Larry Thomas was two laps down, and then those who failed to finish. A big shame for Kenneth Baldwin, who jumped, who uh, had himself a trip onto pit road early. I'm not sure what that was for. Jos van der Ven with a big, big mistake of his own. Or Hamilton and Fred McIntosh failing to get themselves over to the line. But we are straight into interview time here on Racebot TV. You're gonna get John Unsby joining us in the commentary booth. John, that's a massive, massive victory. Last man standing out of all of that. How difficult is it to keep your head when everyone's making mistakes around you? Hi, uh, well, actually that's what you're hoping for. Well, it may be what you're hoping for. You're hoping for drivers to make mistakes, but in, in terms of mentality, how do you uh, sort of don't fall into the mentality that other drivers are having, especially when the pressure's on at the front of the field and people are throwing away the lead left and right? Well, you know, you kind of watch them and you see them start to get squirrely. You just hope you miss them. Uh, of course, you can always do it yourself, too. So I don't know if it's that much pressure. I, was, I raced in real life for 18 years, so these are just cartoons, you know. Well, it's pretty much plain sailing for you, but you find yourself now in a very, very good situation. We haven't had a two-time champion. You're yet to get yourself uh, a championship yet, but massive, massive points for you being taken out of the likes of Lawrence and Rosgen, and especially Jos van der Ven as well, who ran himself into issues. Do you feel now that you've made a platform for yourself for this second half of the season, an important second half of the season, which sees you in the next round or so heading over to Road Atlanta? Well, I don't know. Last season, I, I was leading the points coming into the last race, so I've been there for a while, but Rosgen just got us covered uh, this season. I don't know what happened. All of a sudden, he's much faster, and he wasn't here today, so uh, if he had been here, it would have been a different story. Well, it may have been a different story, but the story today is a victory for you in this second race. Shout out, sponsors. Who gets it done? Ah, I really don't have any sponsors. I guess Uncle Sam for Social Security, that's about it. <laughs> Brilliant. John Unsby there joining us. A race victory for him. John Morgan standing by a second place for him with Neil Heaty. Indeed, John Morgan, a second place there. You got past with three laps to go coming into the uh, bus stop chicane there on the back straight. And it seems like you just couldn't get that position back from John Unsby. No, John's, uh, John's a tough racer, and I didn't see any sense in throwing it away for both of us. Uh, you know, uh, we were pretty closely matched in speed, so it was a good race, a lot of fun. Coming in uh, to this race, you were seventh place in points, uh, a good 30 points uh, you uh, got today. That puts you in 131, about fifth place in the championship or so, if my maths are correct. How does that set you up for the second half of this season? Well, my goal always at the beginning of the season is to finish in the top five. So to finally sort of squeak my way in there this week helps. So it, uh, it feels good. feels like um, sort of back on track. Excellent. Thank you for uh, thank you for coming in, John. Hey, thank you, guys. Got more in there.
coming home in second position for that one. But unfortunately, that's going to be all that we have time for here on Race Spot TV. A massive thanks to everyone that gets it done here for us, the likes of And Wern Designs, the official graphics partners here at Race Spot TV, as well as ATVO and Appgeneer, the official graphics engine here at Race Spot TV. Of course, you can't forget Istvan Ballo and Track Cams 22. Make sure that you check those out, along with Simon Grossman for the animations and Nick Thisson for live timing and scoring. But it's going to be a bumper weekend's worth of racing here on iRacing on RaceBot TV. Of course, we got ourselves the iRacing World Championship Grand Prix Series, which is going to be keeping itself going through the second half of the season. A fantastic championship so far. Won a battle between Martin Kronke, the reigning champion, the five-time champion, Gregor Hutu, and the new pretender, of course, being Mitchell De Jong. As we head to Zandvoort, Will Vincent's favoritest road circuit of them all. Don't forget also to 24 hours of Spa is back on RaceBot TV. Who is going to take the title away from Team Ren Sports Online, or are they going to make it two in a row? It's one that you must check out, and everyone will be keeping their eyes forward of that, especially with Le Mans coming up next month as well. But for the time being, that's Hugo Louis behind the cameras. That's also Neil Heatley, and I... I'm hashtag, do you mind Jake Sperry, the observer of sim racing? Unsby takes a big, big step towards a title challenge, but a lot of mistakes to the likes of Van der Ven. Fitterer takes the points he wants as well, but of course, no leading two, and that means that they have work to pick up on for the second half of the season. See you later.